Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock, and I am the vice president of the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association, uh, who's the host of this session. I am also the founder and owner of Humanist Learning Systems, which is our education partner for this session. And I'm, my company is the one that's issuing the certificates of completion for HRCI and SHRM, which we will tell you how to get later on in the session. Um, my co-host today is Elizabeth Castillo. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm Elizabeth out in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I teach organizational leadership at Arizona State University, and I'm secretary of the International Humanistic Management Association U.S. chapter. We really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. So our guest today is Brian Wellinghoff of Barry Waymiller, which is a $3 billion manufacturer and technical technical service provider with over 200 locations and 12,000 associates around the globe. Uh, Brian forged his unique perspective as an integral part of defining and creating Barry Waymiller's truly human leadership culture. He directed, he directed, uh, directly contributed to multiple chapters in Everybody Matters, as well as scholarly research on the Barry Waymiller culture. His quick ascension in the organization led him to be selected as one of St. Louis's 30 under 30, as he became the youngest corporate director at Barry Waymiller at the time. Uh, he's been repeatedly tapped by CEO Bob Chapman and CPO Ron Spencer to tackle the most challenging organizational opportunities from sales incentives and structures to cultural communication to launching continuous improvement and to launching the Barry Waymiller University and contributing to external initiatives through the Chapman and Company Leadership Institute. Brian, welcome and thank you for joining us. Jennifer, thank you so much. I appreciate the intro. A lot of formal details there, but I'm also a father of four little kids. I'm a seeker who's always looking for additional knowledge, additional wisdom in life that I encounter. And I'm deeply committed to this idea of humanistic management and humanistic leadership. And so happy to have met Jennifer, Elizabeth today, Michael Pearson, a few others on the call today, and honored to have this opportunity to speak with you. And so I'm going to share just a few slides about our background, who we are as an organization, who I am, and then provide plenty of time for dialogue. That's my hope today, is that what I share will kick off dialogue for all of you. And so we've titled this The Power of Humanistic Leadership in Practice, The Barry Way Miller Journey, because we are not academics, as many of you are on the call. We read research periodically. We hope to contribute to it sometimes, but we're really about practicing some of this in this diverse international organization. And Jennifer hit a couple of these highlights. I put this slide up here just to know that many of you probably have never heard of Barry Waymiller. You know, it's not a brand that you might be familiar with um, internationally, but we are a $3 billion provider. We've done now more than 120 acquisitions. We did our 123rd last Friday. Um, more than 12,000 team members around the globe. Yes, um, majority in North America, but many in Germany, um, Italy, France, the UK, India, and China, and some common products that you utilize all the time. So if you're utilizing toilet tissue, paper towels, pizza boxes, we make the machines that companies like Procter & Gamble and Kimberly Clark and other things do along the way. And just to add in that bottom right, we do have an externally focused um, share price, and it just validates that you can achieve humanistic leadership and monetary and financial performance at the same time. So that's a little bit on our company. Jennifer referenced the book, Everybody Matters. We were honored to have our CEO, Bob Chapman, write alongside Raj Sisodia, who I also know believes a lot in humanistic leadership and conscious capitalism, some of the things that he's done. This is kind of the manifesto or mantra from that book. And it really summarizes the Barry Way Miller culture as a whole, that everybody wants to do better, trust them. In every listening session we have with a new acquisition, trust is the number one thing that people want to talk about and that feel that they often don't have with the business that they've been a part of. That leaders are everywhere, find them. Sometimes we have this impression in business that leadership is scarce. We actually believe that it's an abundant resource if we know how to develop and find it. And we believe leadership is found at all levels of the organization. It isn't a specific title. It's based on the actions that you take. The people achieve good things, big and small, every day. Celebrate them. 
recognition, celebration, appreciation, we believe is part of the human experience and therefore it needs to be part of the workplace experience. Some people wish things were different, listen to them. I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Listening has been one of the most powerful aspects that we focused on at Barry Way Miller. It sometimes seems simple, but it is so powerful and what it could unlock. And ultimately everybody matters. Everyone has dignity. Everyone is worthy of our respect. Let's show that to people by our actions and by how we behave. And so, as you see here, we believe that business could be the most powerful force for good in the world. And so I know many of you are business professors or engaged in business, you know, around humanistic management. That's certainly not to diminish the work of large, you know, healthcare organizations or other things, large organizations, but it is our major employers, businesses and other large organizations that really have the opportunity to impact the world if leaders in those organizations will embrace the awesome responsibility they have to care for people in their span of care. This is what we believe at Barry Waymore. It's what I believe personally. And we love that phrase at the end, their span of care, as opposed to their span of control, because we believe that it is something about caring for those in our leadership. And it's not about who I can control or who reports to me, but who I take stewardship of, who I am willing to care for, and really kind of turning that on its head. In the brief time that I have with you today, I want to unlock these four aspects that we think have been critical to putting humanistic management into practice in our organization. I'll just have a quick slide on each one. Vision, describing what the purpose, what the vision can be so people can relate to it. Listening, facilitation, and recognition, and I've touched on a couple of those already. What you're going to see come up here is the vision for what we created in Barry Way Miller University. We launched this about 12 years ago. And as our CEO, Bob Chapman, would say, it was because at the time we struggled to find a college, a university, an educational institution that would teach the leadership based skills that we were looking for. Now, I know I'm speaking to a very enlightened group of people on this call. So we just didn't find all of you 12 years ago, but we instead started our own internal Barry Way Miller University. And so we took some of our practical experience. We took some of the best of what we read in books and what we learned in different places and founded an internal university where we've trained more than a hundred internal associates to be professors of the content that we've developed and provided. We've translated that into four or five, six different languages, depending on the content and taught it you know, across the country and around the world. And you see that phrase at the bottom there, it's our belief that we could use the power of business to dramatically impact the world in a positive way. And so what I want you to know here is we went through a whole two day exercise to create a vision for what we wanted Barry Way Miller to be because it was different than we'd done in our business before. And we needed to paint that picture of what success was gonna look like, of what the reality was gonna be when we lived it fully. And you see it was gonna be integrated, it was going to be inspirational. We believe that our courses fail if they're not inspirational in some way, if they're not touching the head and the heart, and they're not sustainable. And what we meant by sustainable here, at least at the time, was that it lived on, that people made real behavior change um, as a result of our classes. And so happy to talk more about and receive your questions on our visioning process and how we came to this vision of a university. The first major coursework we engaged with was listening, and it, that was a surprise. We thought we'd teach all manner of other things, but I was actually launching our continuous improvement journey, if you're familiar with Lean or Six Sigma, and the number one thing we didn't know how to do actually was listen. We got people in a room, we had great thinking to do improvement events, but we didn't know how to listen to each other. And so how could we learn, how could we collaborate without that essential skill. And so we teach five empathetic listening skills inside Barry Waymore. I don't have the time to give you the full training on each. He's happy to carry that forward, you know, if questions arise around it. But first, being fully present. Then providing acknowledgments to show that you as the listener are staying tuned in, that that presence is continuing. To encourage the other person to speak, not to data mind or be an inquisitor, but to provide simple questions and prompts to the encourage the person to speak more. We teach wholeheartedly that silence is a fundamental aspect of human conversation. Because if there's no silence, that means I was formulating what I was going to say before you stopped thinking, which meant I wasn't fully present 
to what you were saying. And finally, an empathetic response with the facts and the feelings so you can truly know that you're heard. There's often no greater gift in life to feel truly heard and feel and, and truly understood in the process. Again, something I can speak more about, we um, have a specific facilitation model we follow in our classrooms at Barry Waymiller. And this may be familiar to how many of you teach. It might be different. Um, it's a bit of a proprietary model we're very proud of, but we call it the five A's model. And so we teach our internal professors. They can be machinists. They can be accounts payable leaders. They can be HR leaders. They can be engineering leaders. And we give them this focus to first be alert to what your class needs at any given time. To acknowledge when someone speaks, when they raise their hand, when they want to engage, and really respond with your presence and show them that you're fully there. To accept what they say with empathy and curiosity. To drive acceptance more than agreement. To build a really great dialogue. Then to really analyze and discern what's needed next. Is it to spend more time here? Is it to move on? Is it to break open that question to the balance of the class? And to choose uh, strategically when to move the next set of learning with purpose. And so this has been how we develop professors to do that inside Barry Way Miller. I don't think it's a unique approach and that other people don't do it. Many of you on the call might do something similar to this, but we really needed to codify it so that we could teach people in our organization how to do it. And we've received great benefit for that. And my final slide for you today is really focused on recognition. When people do wonderful things, we need to have the chance to recognize that. And we do it with what we call an FBI message. And that's just an acronym for feelings, behavior, and impact. We believe a great recognition message includes the feelings. How does it make you feel? the behavior that the person just did so that you know what your, those feelings are related to and the impact that comes from it. And here's just a simple example. You know, Benjamin, I was inspired. Um, it made my day, it made me happy, it made me engaged, made me energized because of your commitment to our continuous improvement journey. What's the behavior, your thoughts and on ideas on how we could work better as a team? And then what's the impact? It saves us time. It encourages us to think more creatively. And so I give you those little tidbits. Our most popular content that we share is typically on listening and on recognition. Uh, and then just I wanted to share the visioning and facilitation elements there for you so that you give a sense of how the whole system comes together. What has this meant? I'll pull the slides down, but end with a short story. There's a gentleman in our book who I know very well. His name's Randall Fleming. And when we first acquired his business in upstate Wisconsin, he was a self-described Darth Vader character. Through experiences outside of our business in his life, he was closed off to so many things. Ex-military had had some troubling experiences there. And he fought everything we wanted to do to apply humanistic leadership in our business. Until one day at the urging of our friend, he's like, all right, I'll sit in one of the meetings. I'll give it a shot. And he has now become one of the biggest advocates for our business. He's moved from that original facility to a new acquisition to bring our culture there. He is a professor of inspiration. We actually have an inspiration course in our university, but even more so, he's an amazing man and he's a better father because of the process that he's gone through. And that's what I think humanistic management, humanistic leadership can do. It can transform organizations, but can also tra transform lives. And so Jennifer, I'm gonna turn it back over to you with that. Hopefully I've seeded some great questions and dialogue with a few slides and items there. Absolutely. So the first question that comes to my mind based yeah. on that is that the Leadership Institute is training the, 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 the future leaders of your organization. They're people that are coming up and you wanna make them managers. And I assume that's who's going through this. How do you help make sure that the corporate culture you're trying to create makes it to everybody and not just the people going through this training? Ah, so I'm gonna be very clear there. We do have classes designed for certain levels in our organization, but be, because we believe that anyone in Barry Waymiller can be a leader, we define that as everyone has the capacity to support, encourage, inspire, or help someone else grow. And if you have that capability, then you can be a leader at Barry Waymiller. You have to choose the role of leadership, but you can be a leader. Because of that, our three-day listening course is offered to every team member at Barry Waymiller. 
And we're actually doing more things to help make sure that every team member experiences that course as not quite a requirement, but a strong emphasis going forward. A couple of our other introductory classes are the same way. Uh, only more of the more senior courses do you actually have to apply, you know, to kind of get into and do that. So that's first is it is very accessible. But I think underneath your question is a little bit more, all right, how is it not just something in the classroom that a few people are getting? How do you see that it's really out there in the world? And I would say two things. One recognition that I already touched on. If I were to walk into any of your universities, businesses, families right now, and I were to think about assessing culture, one of the first things I would focus on is how is appreciation or recognition or celebration experienced in your organization. I believe that's a key indicator of a strong culture. And the second one is we believe in sharing the vision and the communication. We are a very transparent organization. Once we acquire a business, we tell everybody what performance is. We open the books. And this shocks a lot of the businesses that we get engaged with. We do not think the amount of money that Barry Waymore is making or isn't making needs to be a secret. And so we want everybody to know how the overall business is doing, how the local business is doing, what the key strategy is, because they can only support and participate if they have that kind of information. Jennifer, does that get to your question? Yeah, it does, but I do have a follow-up. Please. <laughs> um, the, the, um, the, the big problem that a lot of companies have, right, is that, um, that the new recruit, you know, how is the new person at the very bottom, bottom, bottom of the organization, how are they enculturated and are they enculturated in the way you want them to be? And what, what steps do you make, do to make sure that new people coming in um, are getting the lessons you want them to get? So let me specifically address that new people. We've made some updates to our recruiting and onboarding practices just in the last couple of years. Um, it is now standard that one of the first things that anybody apl who applies to a Barry Way Miller position receives is our guiding principles of leadership, the statement of our culture, and links to our book and some of the videos you know, that you even just put in the chat already today. We lead with that. And I think it's been a strong um, indicator. 90 plus percent of people who are joining Barry Waymore at this point are joining at least in part because they want to be part of a culture like ours. And so it takes whether you want to say the fortitude or the willingness to be so out front with that, once we do, it's a key part of why people join us. Now, we also have to be compensation competitive, and we also have to be safe, and so many of those other things that go into the practices. But that's happening even before you get the first interview, you're getting some information about Barry Way Miller. Then in that interview, we have a structured interview process based on the team member and leader commitments that we um, have written in the organization. So a bit more detail, I don't have a slide on this at the moment, but happy to follow up. There are five commitments we ask every team member in Barry Way Miller to make, and they're linked to competencies from Corn Ferry, if you're familiar with that organization at all, and they are instills trust, communicates effectively, focuses on customers, optimizes work processes and drives results. And so this is an example. And then there's interview questions that aligns to each of those. So when we're assessing, we're assessing people that will be a good fit for our culture. And then finally, in the onboarding process, you know, you're getting videos from our CEO, Bob Chapman, our president, Kyle Chapman, from, you know, so many other things. So yes, on your first day, you got to fill out all your governmental forms and things like that. But in the first day and first week, you are receiving lots of information and it is becoming a standard practice that everyone has their first day out at lunch with their leader and or team, which again, isn't revolutionary, but it's some of those little things that make sure you're meeting people, you're forming relationships, even from day one. Great. Um, let me kind of dive into this further and talk about failures. Um, Please. The, you know, the, the standard thing is, you know, the joke in most companies, right, is you get the training about what the culture is going to be like, and then the reality of it is completely different. Um, you know, the, 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 the leader, the boss who says, oh, I have an open door policy, but they don't actually want you right, to come into their office. So how do you bridge the gap? And how did you transform through that gap between reality 
and the ideal, how did you navigate that? And how did, more importantly, how did you get people to be honest about where you were failing? That is a great question. I think you hit on part of it at the end there is the honesty. I am not on this call today telling you all that every one of the 12,000 team members in Mary Way Miller is having a great day today or feels engaged you know, in the culture that we're having. That would be false. That would be a lie. And so I think beginning just with the honesty of this is what we aspire to. This is what we want to be. Some days we're really good and we do that well. Some days we don't do it so good. Some parts of our organization are much stronger than other parts. And so I think it begins with that sense of honesty. The second thing that I think is really important is we acknowledge that the number one influence on any individual is their direct leader. And so, you know, that is key. Some of our leaders are much more inclined to this than others, but we provide a lot of opportunities to engage with people outside your leadership group. We've done a lot more cross-functional things. When we do these leadership classes, they're often cross-functional now with Zoom and things, more cross-facility. So even if your leader is just mediocre in some of this culture, we want to give you a chance to tap into committees or other teams and pieces that you can really be a part of and really apply to. And then in terms of failures, this is a really unique Barry Way Miller, uh, Miller practice. We provide a lot of what we call courageous patience with people in the organization. <coughs> Excuse me. If you are a frontline team member or a newer team member and you just haven't gotten it yet, you know, you just haven't been touched by the culture yet, we would have a lot of patience and to know that many people are following decades where they didn't feel a sense of humanistic leadership. And so it can be new to respond to that. But if you get higher and higher in our organization, if your span of control, excuse me, span of care extends further and further, I caught myself there, um, then we are not going to quite be as patient with you. And so a couple of years ago, we asked one of our divisional presidents, we operate in 13 different business units, one of our divisional presidents who had the highest financial performance the previous year, we asked them to leave the organization because they weren't a strong example of our culture. And so while we have a lot of patience with a lot of people throughout our organization, if you are getting to the upper echelons and you're not able to build that capability in your team, that's where we do have serious conversations with folks and, and move forward if it's not the right fit. So are people at the very bottom, do you have people at the very bottom saying my manager like failed to live up to the ideal you painted for me in the initial training? And does that happen? And does it happen enough, I guess, is the question I have. Well, yeah, first, and not to nitpick, Jennifer, but we never use the phrasing people at the bottom of the organization in our organization, you know, and we hate terms like the, the shop floor, like nobody's working on the floor in our business, even though we do manufacturing. We would talk about people at the front lines of our business. We talk about people closest to the customer in our business, just to throw that out there. The other thing that we do, and this is probably something I should have added earlier, we have a specific process that we call listening sessions. And it's essentially focus groups or opportunities for groups of people across the organization to meet with a leader, not necessarily their leader, and talk about how things are going in the organization. And so while we do do some survey processes, we're not as big on engagement surveys as some other organizations are, wanting to make sure that there's chances for people to say, hey, this is what's going well, and this is what isn't going so well. So yes, to your point about honesty, there are definitely people at the front lines of our organization that aren't feeling great right now. I do feel that at Barry Wayne Miller, we have some sense of what some of their frustrations are. The number one frustration across all of Barry Way Miller is I need the parts and information to do my job every day. Particularly in manufacturing, it's really frustrating if you need a part and it's stuck on a boat from China right now and you can't do your work, you're twiddling your thumbs because you want to add value and you can't along the way. It's just as frustrating if you're in finance or accounting and you don't have the information you need to process the invoice or the payable, you know, whatever you might have, well, that's frustrating too. That's our number one. Our number two um, frustration has to do with confusion around um, COVID and work from home policies and other things like that. I don't think we're alone in that challenge. We are doing everything that we can 
to communicate from videos and other different things, but it's just a changing dynamic in our world today. And that change is very frustrating for a lot of folks. And the third is that sense of, I don't know that I trust my direct leader. And specifically, I don't know that they have my best interest at heart. And here's one of the interesting learnings, and, and I'm not trying to go on for too long on different things here, but one of our biggest learnings is sometimes that leader actually cares a lot about their team and is trying to lead them the best way they possibly can, their behaviors just aren't showing that. And so a brief moment of personal vulnerability, um, we have a trust model that includes compassion. And I got some great feedback early in my career that said, Brian, you think you're a really great guy. You volunteer at church. You think you help people and everything, but we don't think you're very compassionate around here. And it hit me in the face, like, what do you mean I'm not compassionate? And they said, well, you're the one that's racing down the hall all the times and not pausing to actually talk to people. You say, hey, how's it going? And you're gone before you can ever even get a response. When we sit down at the start of a meeting and you know, someone's sharing a personal story, how their kid did something or they won a softball tournament or they're cooking green bean casserole or whatever it might be, you're just ignoring things. You're like tapping your pen, like, hey, when are we going to get to the next items here? You seem dismissive of where people are actually at. And it was amazing. It wasn't genuinely that I didn't care for folks. It was that I wasn't demonstrating that. I wasn't demonstrating the compassion linked to it. And so I'm still not perfect, but I'm working on it every single day. And I still get feedback to this day from my team. And I give them the space to do that. Well, Brian, you seemed a little distant on that last call. You know, you moved through things too quickly. You seemed abrupt. Like, all right, I got to keep working on it. I can see now why being present is the first item on your active listening. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, tell me, what's that reaction to you? Just tell me what that comes from. Um, because, you know, I think everybody struggles with this. I, you know, when mm. I was looking at the faces, everybody was like, oh yeah, been there. Okay. Because, you know, there's things, it goes back to the other thing we were talking about where people need information to be able to do their yep. part of the job. Yeah. And so a lot of times we're, we're coming into meetings to get that piece of information so we can, our mind is on the job we want to do. And we're looking for that one piece of information. Uh, and that behavior is not actively present <laughs> for yeah. everybody else in the meeting and what their unique needs are. And, you know, they might be in a place where they need, so, uh, you know, just resonated you know, awesome. guilty is charged. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guilty is charged. Um, if anybody has any questions, please write them down in the chat room. Um, and we'll we'll start asking those. But I do have a couple of other questions to kind of follow up. But do ask your questions in the chat um, and we can get to them. We had several questions in the, the sign up form that had to do with um, the remote environment. Ah. Uh, now, obviously, not only have people been in a remote environment for, but that's only people that can be in a remote environment. If yep. you've got a manufacturing facility, people have to be where the equipment is. Yeah. Um, but you, you're distributed across the globe, so to me, that counts as a remote environment. So, how do you help make sure your remote environments, whatever form they take, are humanistically being you know, managed and led? It is a profound question in today's society. So I'm not going to tell you we have all the answers. I'm going to tell you we're trying to get better at it every single day. And I think at the beginning, there was some technological, you know, issues. Like maybe a year ago, I can't speak for you, Jennifer, but we're still figuring out Zoom and how to pin people certain that everybody, do I want a big screen or do I want gallery view or all those kind of things? I feel that we and probably most organizations have started to figure out the nuts and bolts of how to do some of those things. However, you know, it really is interesting. What is the willingness of people to turn their cameras on? We strongly encourage people to have their cameras on so we can see as much nonverbal um, participation as not. Now, I happen to have my background blurred out right now. In Barry Waymiller, we typically don't blur out backgrounds. Whereas I happen to be at home right now. I happen to be in a spare bedroom. Um, and so you didn't need to see, you know, the uh, mattress and stuff behind me. But we often share things like that. And so people have strategically placed now artifacts from their life um, where you can see them. So when I'm in my office, 
I have a picture of my children hanging right above my right shoulder. So when you see Brian at work, you see Brian and Brian's family and what we do. What the image we present, I think, is really important. A second aspect is finding ways to make it engaging. We have a, uh, I mean, we don't own any sock in it or anything like that, but we have a tool that we love called Mentimeter that does real-time voting. I know there's other similar tools, but any way to get people engaged with polls, with questions, with graphics, with chat, with a whole host of other things, I think that is really important there. But more than anything else, I think it is the sense of how we kick off a meeting with presence. And Jennifer, I'll give you a compliment. I think you have a nice presence for how you kicked things off. You know, we've started with a sense of connecting to the, the humanity of each other. If you start and the first thing that's up on a screen is a massive spreadsheet, and that's how it is the whole meeting, it's a lot different in being humanistic than if we spend time in gallery view or a few minutes seeing you, seeing me, you know, seeing that full encompassing. And even just the fact that you shared some things about your personal life. If anybody joined later, some things about cooking and some plans that you have over the holiday time, that's similar to how we kick things off at Barry Way Miller. A bit of personal disclosure, a bit of personal connection, a bit of recognition at the start of a meeting. We believe the first five minutes of any meeting set the tone for the balance of the meeting. And so if it's all logistical and spreadsheets, you're gonna get that kind of meeting. And if it's connecting a little bit with each other, you'll get that kind of meeting. That's interesting. You just reminded me of how um, the Unitarian Universalist sessions kick off with the blessings and 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 uh, uh, problems. They you know they encourage people to come up and talk about things that they're happy about and things that they're struggling with. Yeah. Right. Um, the the quest part the second part of the question had to do with the the disbursement of your staff. You sure. obviously don't have a single office. Yeah. Um, and you know you've got people working you know, with machines and then also people working in offices. So how do you help make sure that this is translating to people working on machines? Yeah. So in general, we find it easier to build culture face-to-face, person-to-person. And as you're alluding to, we're in several essential industries. And so our frontline machinists and assemblers and even engineers never worked from home. You know, many of them were on site throughout the entire pandemic, and we gave them special recognition, especially a year ago, as we walked through some of that. In some places, they formed such a great rapport with each other, they didn't want other people to return, both for health issues, they knew people that were there, they were safe, and they knew how to do it. And like, all right, you're just going to be getting in the way of certain things along the lines. But where we can't, you know, a phrase from my own spiritual background where we can break bread together. Literally, where we can have, you know, cafes and other and coffee stations and water coolers where people can interact. We find a lot of culture is built in those micro interactions. So a benefit to us is we are a global organization. I think remote engagements like we have right now have helped us become a more global business. They've helped us get feedback from people in China and France and Italy in real time with people from North America that we could have done before, but we didn't do as much. Now when a meeting you know, has three time zones in the US, well, we might as well invite everybody. And, and it, it has helped in that. What I think it's done is really missed out on those micro interactions. And so we encourage, I can't say this is commonplace across Barry Waymiller, but especially I in my span of care encourage people, show up a minute or two, or two early if you can. Stay on a minute or two later. You know, as much as I said, I'm not very compassionate sometimes with these things, it really carries extra weight in this virtual environment to, you know, have that water cooler talk or that talk you used to have as you were going into a conference room and setting up the technology, just to connect a little bit with how people are doing. I think we lose that when, and I've experienced this too in our organization, sometimes with Zoom, all right, this meeting ends at noon and the next one starts at noon. Like if you're not on by 1201, it's like, holy cow, what's happening? It was different when, okay, you'd walk in the room, you'd get set up, you'd say, hey, I'm gonna run to the restroom for just a second. We miss that sometimes in the virtual space. And if we leave a little grace and space for people that can help. Elizabeth, I know, and thank you, Brian. And I just- Yeah, this is great. <laughs> I almost went into the next thing, but thank you for that. Um, Elizabeth, I know we have questions coming up in the chat room. So 
Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I'll start off with Urias, who's asked, um, what is um, BW's perspective regarding the role of business in an employee's experience of grief, loss, mental health, and well-being? Well, there's a couple of great aspects of that question. Thank you for it. The first is we need to acknowledge that we are not mental health experts in very way. We are not trained counselors or anything. So while we want to be very open to people sharing about their personal lives, we do not discourage that. We want you to share about what's going on in the balance of your life. We are not trained therapists. And so if that is what somebody ultimately needs, we have a really great um, ComPsych um, employee assistance program that we can reference people to. I think that's the first thing that I would say. The second thing that a story from a colleague of mine, she came to us, what, about five years ago now from another organization, and she said, you know, I lost one grandparent when I was with this other organization. And it was like three hoops to jump through to get approval to go attend the funeral, or it was like a real distraction. I was kind of looked down upon when I wanted to take a full day off, you know, do something like that. And she said, then I came to Barry Waymiller, and very unfortunately, I lost my other grandparent. But this time around, my leader just told me, take whatever time you need and let me know when you're available to come back. That's one aspect that we have. It's very informal, but in terms of grief, loss, time, I know particularly in education, people taking kind of mental health days or things like that. We haven't taken a formal mental health day, but I think we do a really good job informally. I had a gentleman whose uh, three children got COVID all at once. And I just told him, like, hey, be at home, you know, do what you need to do and reach out to me if you need help along the way. So some of those informal things. Then specifically well-being, I'll put that in a slightly different bucket. We have a whole well-being program. We have a director of well-being in our corporate offices. And for us, that is all encompassing. It's not just physical well-being, though that gets a lot of focus. It is relational well-being. It is financial well-being. And we have training and support in all those different areas. But we have well-being committees in almost all of our facilities. Try to come up with unique, exciting ways. There's a January challenge to help us lose weight um, after the holidays. Uh, and, and really just trying to build that out. I think it's really great because it focuses on the positive. It's not, hey, you can't smoke. If you do, you lose this amount of money. It's if you choose not to smoke, you get these points and these points can be redeemed for other things. So I'm always trying to take a positive moniker and reinforce positive behavior wherever possible. And Huria, I hope that answers your question. If you got more, feel free to let me know. Yeah, Huria, did you want to follow up on that? Feel free to unmute yourself. It sounds like it's pretty informal in terms of bereavement policy, or if an employee needs to take some time off, that they would just work that out with their leader, and it happens on an individual basis. Is that right, Brian? I would say practically, yes. Now, to acknowledge, many of our corporate policies were written 30 years ago until we updated them last summer. So this has been an active focus recently to change to like parental leave, adoption policies, um, you know, bereavement policies. So I'll admit as an 18 year associate in Barry Way Miller, I'm not exactly sure the details of the bereavement policy right now, but I've never been concerned with that because both through my leader and through the people that I lead, it's been more do what you got to do and we'll make sure that we have the policy that supports you. Can I Thank just you. follow up on that real quick? Yeah. Um, because you are a manufacturer and making machines that other people use, um, you know, having someone on the line working on those machines can really put you back. So how do you balance the, the need for the body and the expertise to be there versus the need of the individual to have, you know, time? And, and we find the number one thing, if we get deep enough into our humanistic leadership journey, is to really make it a team decision rather than a leader decision. When it feels top down, hey, I need five bodies on the line right now. Jennifer, I need you to go to that um, funeral late because I need a body on the line. I mean, that's never received well, and it's really not very human, in my opinion, in the process. What we try is to get to a team dynamic where we say, hey, the team owns getting this done for the customer. The team needs five people on the line. Hey, Jennifer had something come up in her life that she needs to you know, be gone from work and support that. Who can step in for Jennifer? 
And sometimes the leader steps in. Sometimes somebody else says, well, I can stay and do overtime. I can come in you know, early on a different shift. And again, I can't say this is commonplace across Barry Waymiller, but in one of our facilities, we used to have set shift times. And we actually moved away from that about two years ago. And we said, this is the coverage that we need across 20 hours of the day. Team, why don't you talk about when we want to come in? And three people raised their hand and said, I want to come in at 4 a.m. And I want to be done by noon so I can go fish in the afternoons. Love it. Somebody else said, I want to come in at nine because I have children that I need to get to school at the beginning of the day. It was amazing. And when we left it open to the team, they problem solved along the way. Somebody said, all right, well, I can get my spouse to drop off this kid and I can be in at 830 if you can stay until this time. It was a really fascinating experience in human behavior, but they already had the foundation of trust and teamwork with each other. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to chime in with um, my question. Um, I really yeah. like the feelings, behavior, impact. Yeah. Um, model, and you, and especially the you know example with the quote of how to communicate that. I'm wondering when the feelings aren't so positive. So like you're aggravating me. I, my hair is turning gray because of your behaviors. How, yeah. how do we handle that? And and in particular, you know, attending to power dynamics. So am I safe to say that with the boss? What is the psychological safety? That so much there. The first thing that I'll offer, so I mentioned FBI in terms of recognition. So our implication there is that it's positive, but we use the same methodology in confrontation. And so we believe that a good confrontation message also has the feelings, the behavior, and the impact. And we have training on that as well. As you might imagine, the recognition training usually takes 20 to 60 minutes, you know, depending on how deep we want to go. The confrontation training usually takes 60 to 180 minutes because it's much more sensitive with those power dynamics and different things along the way. One of the biggest things that we teach around confrontation, again, same feelings, behavior, and impact, but first assessing for yourself, discerning for yourself, what is the purpose of you making this statement? Is it to genuinely enter in with a conversation with others, with a, another person to try to mutually meet your needs? Or is it to bellyache about something or let off steam, you know, to vent? Well, it's rarely effective to vent to your leader, you know, about all the things that annoy you about them. And so it gets, you know, to some of those discernment aspects. Psychological safety is a term that we really love that we've engaged with a little bit more, I would say not at a professional level. And what I mean by that is I don't know that any of us have read the in-depth literature of exactly what psychological safety is or builds, but we know that it relates back to the trust that I spoke about before. And so if you don't trust, if you don't have some degree of safety that you can say things to your team, to your peers and to your leader, it's gonna be a challenge along the way. And that's where, you know, we do lots of things to help build that sense of trust, but also if you want to call them skip level meetings or, you know, listening sessions or those kind of things, um, we try to stay really close to if, if a leader is not building an environment of psychological safety, we don't want to identify that really early and, you know, try to build that going forward. Now, I'll tell you, there's still times when I'm in the room with our CEO and a whole bunch of other people, and you can tell that people are hesitant, they're not sure what to say. That's when we feel it's our job as other leaders in the organization to make fun of him, to say tough feedback, to lead off with that so we can set the model and example for others. The most fascinating thing about our leadership team, I work closely with all of them, is they love someone who will give them trouble and make fun of them a little bit because it feels more human to them. If everyone is just giving them positive, glowing phrases all the time, they know that's not real, um, but it takes time to get there. Um, great, that's super helpful examples. Um, Kathleen asked a question about um, the use of the word fitting in. Mm. Um, and so a lot of times organizations do expect people to, to fit and they use, you know, like uh, even for hiring, like are they a good fit with our organizational fit? Um, but that can lead to some exclusionary practices. Mm. So how do you, you know, manage that balance between, you know, fit versus inclusion? Who is that a great question? I will acknowledge in front of all of you, we do not have the answer to that. We are trying, but I don't think we have the answer. 
What do I, what do I know from our experience? We are not looking for everybody in Barry Waymiller. And when I say that, we are not looking for people who are not, who don't want to be engaged in the workplace, who don't want to share a little bit about themselves at work, who don't want to be part of a thriving, vibrant culture and business. A short example, we acquired a business, the head of HR of all places uh, stayed with us for about nine months. And the day before a huge presentation resigned, he said, I'm just not into all this people frou-frou stuff or whatever. I'm going to go somewhere else. He happened to move across town to another business, which we acquired three years later, and he entered his resignation before that, uh, that acquisition was completed. He was not a bad person. We did not push him out, but he just knew that wasn't the right place for him, and that's okay. It's okay for people to find different places that they relate to. What we always need to make sure of is that people don't feel excluded because of something about themselves. They're, you know, classic things, you know, like gender or ethnic background or other things like that, but also socioeconomic background, political opinions, you know, all sorts of different things at this point. I think we do mediocre at that right now, meaning I am not aware of overt you know, racist or sexist experiences or things like that. My leader who has been for the last 18 years is an amazing female leader in our organization. And she's had the ear of the CEO for the last 18 years. And so there's small anecdotal examples, but we've not been able to systematize that in ways that I can confidently say to any of you on this call, I'm confident that no one feels, you know, discriminated against, excluded, or a lack of belonging because of something about themselves. And so I think we're on that journey. We'd love to hear from those of you that maybe have more experience in those areas or would love to get more in the literature and in communication about how we continue to do that. We do have a specific inclusion initiative happening now. We're aware of the need to grow, um, you know, but still finding our way. Well, I think your onboarding practices, right, of even when somebody applies, sending them the cultural, you know, uh, ethos so that they have an idea of what they're getting into and they can self-select out if it's not aligned with their values is a, a good start. Um, I want to jump to Marty's question, um, which is, you know, so often when people come out of business school, um, you know, they've been indoctrinated about, oh, it's all about the bottom line, maximizing shareholder value. Um, and then, you know, to come into a company like this, it seems like if we could catch them upstream a little bit more, you know, so what recommendations would you make for business schools so that they could be more um, aligned with the, the culture of care you're talking about, the span of care? I'm not sure if somebody planted this question with Marty, but Marty, you're brilliant. And thank you for this question, because that, I mean, that's part of the reason I'm on this call today is um, Bob Chapman, myself and other senior leaders we believe um, we're, we're called and we have the opportunity as an organization to partner with great educational institutions and great educators like yourselves to help change that paradigm. Marty is so right that if you've already learned in school that it's all about agency theory and it's all about you know, purely stakeholder or excuse me, shareholder return, and then you go to a large organization, I don't even need to name some of them right now, you know who they are, that beats all the humanity out of you, and then you come to Barry Waymiller, it's a huge reclamation project to do. And not that we haven't done that, you know, like Randall Fleming, we've broken through, we can do that, but it just means that somebody spent 5, 10, 15, 20 years of their life missing all of that. So we want to be active in engaging um, with educational institutions. Um, a few people on this call had the chance to visit uh, one of our facilities this summer. Um, I've done a lot of teaching recently at Fordham, thanks to Michael Pearson and a number of others there that have given me that opportunity. Um, but we, thanks, Michael. But we'd love to continue to explore, um, you know, what that can look like either directly or through some of our content or speaking to groups of professors or different things like that. We are super excited um, about that. Uh, but, but even just more to, to Marty's question or point there, I believe the young people of today are excited about sustainability. I think they're excited about inclusion and belonging. I think they're excited about considering stakeholders beyond just the bottom line. And, and I'll close my answer to this one with saying when I got my MBA, this was you know 20 plus years ago now, but was sitting in the room with orientation and the orientation leader asked, 
well, all right, so why did you all decide to get your MBA? And somebody said, you know, to get new skills. Somebody else said to change industries, to grow, to learn more about myself. And then someone finally raised their hand and said, money. And it was just applause. It was like this, you know, raucous applause and agreement. Like everybody just wanted to say that. I wasn't sure that it was appropriate yet. I want to believe that business schools, that educational environments, that businesses can be a little bit different around that, especially in the competitive environment for talent today. It is every day someone is getting offered 20, 30, or 50% more at Barry Way Miller to go somewhere else. And some people are choosing that. And that's okay for their family. There's all sorts of different needs that are out there. But I just spoke to someone uh, Monday night, it was, that just got offered 20% to go somewhere else. And this is what she said to me. She said, well, I mean, I turned them down immediately. I wouldn't even entertain it. I love what I'm doing here. And most specifically, my leader is amazing. Barbara is an amazing leader. I would never leave her because this is the kind of place that I want to work. It'd take a lot more than 20% to get me to even think about it. And that's what I think the possibilities are with humanistic leadership, humanistic management. If we can encourage that sense in our students, undergraduate, graduate, wherever, if we can help people continue to tap into that throughout their careers. And if we can give them a leader that truly cares for their team members, that's that's a future that I think we all might want to be a part of. Um, that is a great example. Thank you so much, Brian. I, I'm curious how that translates to like your investor relations team and communicating that to your shareholders who may have a much more singular lens of how they're evaluating the company. And so this is where I will fully acknowledge on this group, we are a privately held business. And so we're not on the stock exchange or something like that. Now we are in contact with some um, you know, publicly traded businesses. They're still trying to do things. Um, the CEO of uh, Panera Bread is a new friend of ours. I'm sure all of you have at least you know, a couple of contacts around that do some of these things. And we want to find them and bring them together a bit more. But uh, the number one investor in our organization outside of the Chapman family is actually the Walton family through their investment arm. And we are touted as the number one investment of the Walton family that all other investments are compared to. And the reason for that is we talk at our board meetings about culture. We talk about leadership. We talk about this as part of our brand, who we are and who we want to be. And it doesn't hurt that we back that up with great performance. We believe highly engaged team members are highly performing team members. And we've outperformed Berkshire Hathaway by like 70% over the last 15 years or something. So you keep that track record of performance. We want to prove that businesses can be great to people and have above average returns going forward. Wonderful, really quick, if you're looking for a certificate of completion, my company, Humanist Learning Systems, has gotten this approved for HRCI and SHRM. I also offer a general certificate of completion. So message me, I need your first name, your last name, your email so I can get it to you, and also which certificates you want, um, the HRCI, SHRM, and general, thanks. Awesome. Are there other questions? And people can type them into chat. I'm trying to follow, but if I missed one or if anybody wants to come off mute, I have thoroughly enjoyed my time today. I see Marty's got his hand up. Marty, yeah. you want to go? Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, I, it's a hard question to write in the chat, and I'll very quickly say it because I know we don't have much time left. You know, one of my concerns is, th is that uh, I read a lot of stuff uh, that has to do with the global international uh, business world. And there have been some books that have come out in the last few years that are showing uh, a tremendous amount of collusion among some of the biggest, largest companies in the world, <clears throat> particularly to try to influence all kinds of world economic policy. And uh, many of them are, of course, extremely conservative politically, and they're interested in the agenda uh, that was spoken about by Nancy McLean in the democracy in chains, which is that uh, these industries uh, want to basically marginalize the average worker and, and bring the wealth initiatives to most democracies. And, and particularly, uh, you know, The Shadow Sovereigns, which was written by Susan George. If you haven't read that book, you won't sleep for a few nights mm. because they have really infiltrated the UN, the, uh, the World Bank, 
many institutions to try to change uh, and favor the upper 10%. And I get very concerned about that. I love your work, I support it. The problem about it is that some of the biggest leaders in the world don't give a damn about the average person. And I don't know how you can affect those really wealthy, long-term profit motivated uh, who want to be now uh, at the top of the, of, the, uh, of the mountain and really don't care about how they get there. Well, I think there's a lot in that question, Marty. I mean, the short answer is, yeah, I don't have some secret way to change, you know, just to throw some names that we're probably all familiar with, you know, Jeff Bezos or, um, you know, uh, head of Tesla, his name Elon Musk, or, you know, other folks like that, and certainly other many corporations, you know, I, I don't have the way to change people's minds, I think, along the way sometimes. What I would provide, perhaps as hope, perhaps not, is one of the things that I'm amazed by is how many people are part of not those largest global organizations, but, you know, mid-tier size. Like, I don't know what you think of Barry Waymail, or we consider ourselves kind of a mid-tier player. Three billion isn't nothing, but it sure as heck isn't GE or Tesla, you know, or something like that. And because I've sat in the room with Bob Chapman and a lot of the CEOs he speaks with, there is genuinely a lot of interest taken in caring for people and moving from success to significance sometimes. So I can't speak to the overarching engagement with the UN or the World Bank, other than the only thing in my opinion that can counterbalance the greedy and the narcissistic is great people who are not greedy and narcissistic, who are humanistic and who are willing to speak to that and speak to how it provides all sorts of benefits. I believe that humanistic leadership is the way to be because I believe that's who we are as human beings. I believe it's what's required by dignity, by my own faith, by my own uh, experience and wisdom. But I also happen to believe that it's the most effective way to lead a business long-term, that it leads to the most impactful results and achievements. And I think for more of us, and I hope I'm with like-minded people on this call to share that in our classes, in our speaking engagements, in our consulting groups and things, that's a possibility, though I'm not sure that it counterbalances, you know, some of the large international forces you're talking about. So um, we're getting towards the end of oh. this. We only have like a minute left. Um, I want to thank you, Brian, for coming on and sharing your thoughts with us and sharing uh, the Barry Way Miller approaches to humanistic leadership. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. This has been the International Humanistic Management Association's Humanistic Professionals Lunch and Learn. Um, and Brian, I want to give you a chance to have like one more bit of parting knowledge you want to share with us before we sign off? Well, thank you, Jennifer. And I'll actually use it as a way to respond to the item that Ken just put in the chat. I wholeheartedly believe that leadership is an invitation, that we receive the invitation every day to be a leader in the way that we choose our behaviors. If we choose to connect with other people, if we choose to support them, encourage them, recognize them, provide them a sense of vision, um, you know, facilitate good interactions in our world, then we are a leader and we naturally cascade that to the people that we're around. On the flip side, if we let fear inhibit us or our past experiences or our paradigms about what is or isn't appropriate get in the way, or we choose not to be a leader that day, to not make ourselves vulnerable and caring in a way that then we naturally deter more humanistic leadership in our world. And so it's been an honor to be with all of you today. If I take anything away, it's that for you and I, I include myself in this, if we can take any inspiration from today, it's to do one additional thing in the next 24 hours that can be humanistic care and leadership of others. Recognition, sharing a comment with somebody, spending that extra moment at the start of your next Zoom call to really connect with someone. I'm going to attempt to do that. I invite you to do the same. And together, can we be something more together than we can be apart? Thank you, Brian. Um, again, this has been the International Humanistic Management Association's uh, Humanistic Professionals Lunch and Learn. If you enjoyed this session, we have a variety of these things coming up. We have other sessions that we do. Um, all of our previous sessions are on video. And uh, we encourage you to join our association and help us 
you know, fund the work that we do. And so become a member. Thank you so much and have a good afternoon.